couple of weeks ago, we did a deep dive into the secret and mysterious mystery school and cult of Dionysus. This cult consisted of barbaric people who practiced not only human sacrifice, but cannibalism. This cult is also allegedly the first ever secret society. And one of its most famous members was Alexander the Great. As a military leader, Alexander the Great ruled his people through brutality. During his reign and conquest, he destroyed the Persian Empire, as well as parts of India and Egypt. As most people know, Alexander the Great would go on to die very very, very young. But like many of our notable people throughout history, did you know that his tomb and therefore his body are now missing? But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit the subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a big thank you to all of our producers and our Patreons here on Esoteric Atlanta. Without you guys, we would not be able to do what we do. If you would like to join our Patreon community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce. And today on Mystery Monday, my favorite day of all the days here on the channel, Mystery Monday, we're going to be talking about the missing body of Alexander the Great. All right, you guys, before we get into it, I do have to apologize. I keep getting hot and cold and hot and cold. So I've got my sweatshirt on right now. I will probably take it off here in a minute. But with that being said, people have asked me a lot about this sweatshirt that I wear sometimes. I got questions about it in my class on Sunday. And I just have to let you guys know, if you go down the description box below, I have an Amazon affiliate link. Now, I know some of you guys know that because if you follow along with our channeled stuff on Tuesdays, you know that I put all the books, all the material in the book list on that Amazon link so that you guys have easy access to the material that we're looking at. But I also have sections for like clothes, for yoga gear, all sorts of stuff down there. So if this is something, if you are one of the people that asked me about this, this cozy little sweatshirt that I have, it is down in the Amazon affiliate link. Just follow the link. It's right in the description box below and you'll find the category for clothing. Just click on that and it'll, you'll find this and you can make a purchase if you want to as i've now taken it off because again i'm it's it's that weird time of year right where you're hot you're cold you're hot you're cold and i'm someone that's pretty cold nature i get, I get cold really easily so i might put it back on at some point during during the filming so please i hope that doesn't bother you please excuse excuse me if it does but again if you're someone who has expressed interest in anything that i wear on the show any types of makeup, anything like that, it's all down in the Amazon leak below. All right, let's get into this very interesting and somewhat scandalous mystery. So obviously, most people know who Alexander the Great was. And it's one of the biggest historical figures that we study in school in, in most countries. Alexander the Great was known as the King of Kings. He's also still to this day one of the most tyrannical rulers that the world has ever seen. He was known to be a military hotshot, and because of his military skills, he was truly able to terrorize all of the empires that he invaded and conquered. Now, again, if you joined us for our deep dive into the Dionysian cult you will know that he was a part of that movement in that secret society where they very much practice cannibalism and all sorts of nefarious um, activities again it was considered to be the start of secret societies so if you did miss that and you want more information on that particular group um, i will link that episode down in the description box below so you can go back and re-watch information on that so obviously we know with a lot of these secret societies that are based around very dubious and nefarious activities 
we know that a lot of the people that participate in that do rise up in power. So many people might believe that Alexander the Great was able to obtain a lot of his brutality and his power through his association with the Dionysian cult. And I don't know, possibly. It seems that that is kind of the standard for people in our world past and present, um, that that is how they achieve power. I mean, I think about those little islands, one particular island that is down in the Caribbean, um, of all the activities that go on there, we, we know for sure that the Dionysian cult is is not dead. It's, it's very much still alive and still active. And so it's just interesting to connect the dots. We, we think the, that history is so far behind us and that a lot of these things, barbaric things that they did, we just don't do anymore, but we actually do do them. And I know most of you guys watching know exactly what I'm talking about. So I just want to, again, to reiterate how fascinating it is that Alexander the Great was not only participating in this particular group, but he was also from a blood-like family, meaning that he was very born into a very, very powerful family and obviously was very much conditioned to turn into the complete socio-psychopath that he, he was. Alexander was the son of Philip II. He succeeded Philip II in 336 BC when he was only 20 years old. Obviously, Alexander the Great lived a life of privilege. And interestingly enough, he was privately tutored by one of my favorite philosophers, Aristotle. So something fascinating about this time period, too, in Macedonia and Greece is that it was common for a polygamy to be practiced. I Maybe I missed that in school. I mean, let me know in the comment section below. Do you remember them teaching us that polygamy was practiced at this time? I mean, we, we see polygamy in the Bible. We see it with, with Abraham and David and all those guys, all of them. We see them with multiple, multiple. I mean, Solomon had, what, a thousand concubines? Listen. It is not. No little girl is out there dreaming about the day that she gets to be a concubine. So that's a, a topic for a different day. I, I'm, I'm very much against polygamy because most of the time I, I don't believe that the women are there by choice. I think it's more of a um, trafficking situation. But before I get too off course, I, I, I really I don't know if I just like block that from my memory when I was in school. But that was shocking to me when I was researching for this case. You know, I'm not going to go into too much detail about Alex Alexander the Great's life because we all know who he was and this is more about his missing body. Um, so just a little bit of information before we get to him dying. But I just, I didn't know that that he, he it was normal to practice polygamy for the Greeks and the Macedonians at this time. Again, did y'all know that? Because I don't know where I was in school if I... If I just block that. But Philip II had a lot of wives. And Alexander was the son of probably Philip II's most notorious wife. This was a woman named Olympias. And if you guys want me to do a deep dive into Olympias, let me know in the comment section below. Because when I was researching this case, I almost got a little too sidetracked looking into Olympias because there is definitely some shit there. So very scandalous woman with obviously a lot of folklore and mystery around her. Obviously, this was a woman who probably was a part of the Dionysian cult by what I saw in my research. Um, but if you guys want me to deep dive into her, I will do that. Just let me know in the comment section below. So anyway, he's like this son of Olympias and, and Philip II, who's ruling Macedonia. Um, but there's like this inner struggle and inner competition between the different wives. It really, it really reminded me, if you guys uh, remember when we talked about the Testimony of Solomon or the Testament of Solomon and the Lost Keys of Solomon, these, these missing books of the Old Testament that we covered a little over a year ago. And if you guys remember with Solomon, his mother reminds me a lot of Olympias and the, 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 the scandalous stuff that Solomon's mother did in order to make sure Solomon was the one that took the kingship from David. 
Um, if you guys remember with the story of Solomon and David, Solomon took the throne before David had even passed away. Um, and Solomon was not the oldest son. And, and it is said in the Testament of Solomon where Solomon does admit that he is a worshiper of Moloch. So we shouldn't be venerating Solomon. Like he was doing some like the same shit, the Dionysian stuff. He was doing the same stuff, right? But the, the story of Alexander the Great and Solomon, they just, just mirror each other because Alexander the Great was also given some ruling, uh, some, some stuff to do uh, in his father's absence where he really started to show his, um, his strength in the military industrial complex we'll say of that day before his father had even died but with that being said there was a lot of inner conflict between all these different wives and their children for the power of the macedonian empire now again i mention this because right before philip ii was murdered because he was there was another ten, there more tension in the family because Philip took on a new wife, another one. And this new wife had even more of a pure bloodline than Olympias had. And so if Alexander's father, Philip II, had a son with this new wife, then that son would usurp alexander in power so with that being said philip ii alexander's father was killed pretty much right after he married this new wife and there's still a lot of suspicion around alexander's involvement in his own father's death also suspicion around alexander's mother's involvement in her, her husband's death because like any narcissistic mother, you're going to want to make sure that your son beats out the other sons for the power of this empire. And I, I'm going to say, you know, it's been a long time since Alexander was on this earth, but there's always been something a little strange about Alexander's relationship to his own mother. I'm just going to put it out there. There's, I, I even remember even though I did not remember that the Macedonians practice polygamy, I do remember being in high school and studying this and studying the mom and thinking that there was something strange between this mother and son relationship, maybe some incest. I don't know. That's just my gut feeling. Well, to make it even more suspicious that um, Alexander had something to do with his father's death after his father did die, Alexander did a huge sweep of the empire, meaning that he had all of his uncles, his cousins, siblings, half siblings executed that he thought would be a potential threat to him taking over the power. In fact, in this situation, Alexander's mother, Olympias, was also kind of pointed out that she potentially was the one who poisoned some of alexander's half siblings i mean god you guys talk about some crazy mommy issues the more i study about these rulers of the past the more appealing it seems like being a, just a peasant would have been <laughs> like i don't think the peasants had this much drama in their lives so after alexander was able to totally take over his family and through brutal force become the head honcho the king of kings he then set out on his quest to take over the world. Now, Alexander died at only 32 years old. Now, how Alexander died is also somewhat of a mystery. Now, most of you guys know that Alexander the Great was very sexually active, but it is said that he liked both men and women, probably leaned more to liking men which is whatever. But the reason why I, I bring this up is because Alexander's, his comrades, his military men that went with him on these escapades across the empire to conquer and destroy and, you know, be the big alpha male, a lot of these men were also some of Alexander's lovers. And so if you can imagine, at the, at the time of his death, there was a lot of intensity a lot of passion. We, we know that kings often have 
quite a lot of people around their deathbeds, but, but there was just more charge. And I kind of wanted to bring that up because when it comes to burying Alex, when it comes to figuring out what happened to his body, I just want you to remember that this man was having affairs with a bunch of other people that kind of play play into this drama con concerning what to do with him after he passed away. The cause of his death is unclear, but most likely was caused by too much alcohol or, in fact, poisoning. He ended up dying in the palace of Nebuchadnezzar II, which is in Babylon. And of course, you guys probably know that Babylon is modern day Iraq. Now, again, I say that there's still kind of a mystery around Alexander's death. It wasn't like his father's death. He, he got sick. There was a sickness that came over him that eventually took him. Some people even think that Alexander might have had leukemia. That was one of the theories that he, he died slowly of cancer. Some people do say that it could have been malaria, which is understandable. And here, if you were present when my, when my ch uh, channel started, I did a whole playlist on Savannah, Georgia called Scandalous Savannah. I'll place that playlist down in the description box below. And we talked a lot about like yellow fever, even here in the United States, where I, where I live in the Southeast, malaria, yellow fever, all these, um, insect uh diseases were spreading and people you know it took people out for sure it, it took people out so that that's understandable at this point we have modern medicine we have ways to prevent this stuff but for you know the, the 300 bc time malaria could have really been a huge problem for a lot of people so th that's very understandable that people would assume it could have possibly been malaria some people assume or think that it must have been just his his lifestyle that he he had gone through so much brutality and war and that his body had just given out because it just it just couldn't take it anymore. All very logical assumptions by people in the past as to why he passed away. But the biggest, the biggest thought is that he died from the flu. Now, of course, uh, the flu for us is not that big of a deal. I mean, I last month got the flu twice in one month and I was sick as a dog. I thought I was going to die. There are so many different strands of the flu. It just depends on which one you get. But influenza can be deadly in certain situations. Usually in modern times, we think of it as being deadly with the elderly people. But if Alexander did have something else going on like if his body was worn down by war if there were open wounds stuff like that something like the flu could have very easily taken his life but then again the most suspicious is poisoning that is definitely something people have have thought that he was poisoned but we do have some answers now because in our modern times his symptoms were placed into the Global Infectious Disease Epidemiology Network, which gave back many different diagnoses. It came back to the probability of Alexander dying of the flu was at 41.2%. But the biggest probability of Alexander's death was in fact poisoning. You know, if his mama was going around poisoning his half siblings to make sure that Alexander wouldn't have any competition for the throne, then I hate to say it, but karma's a bitch. So according to the Global Infectious Disease Epidemiology Network, we can rule out leukemia, we can rule out malaria, we can rule out battle wounds, but we can't rule out the flu and we most certainly cannot rule out poisoning. I just think this is so interesting and it could have been a number of people like it, it could have very well been somebody who was in competition with Alexander for power or my friends. It could have been a scorned lover. I mean, now we get into a bit of a sticky situation because Alexander the Great left no heir. Now I do believe that he didn't think he was going to be done at 32 and that's why he didn't have an heir. But nonetheless, he left nothing. The, these men did not know who was going to now take over the empire and seeing that Alex had like murdered his siblings. 
there was basically a free for all as to who would now be the new king of kings. And there were two people that kind of competed for this role. This was Perdiccas and Ptolemy. Now, both those names might sound really familiar for, for you. Ptolemy, we have spoken about before. I'll link those videos down in the description box below too. There's gonna be lots of videos in the description box when we spoke about Cleopatra because Cleopatra was a Ptolemy. So this is her great, 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 whatever grandfather that we're looking at. Now in reality, Perdiccas was probably the one that should have taken over because he was Alexander's second in command. Alexander had also given Perdiccas his ring when he was on his deathbed, which could have been seen as Alexander anointing Perdiccas as his new, as his heir, basically as the new king, the new new ruler. But Ptolemy was also somebody that was very close to Alexander. Ptolemy had helped Alexander conquer Egypt, which is why Ptolemy ended up taking over the territory of Egypt, hence why Cleopatra was there. I think the most shocking thing for people is that people forget that Cleopatra was not Egyptian. She was Greek. So basically what we're looking at at this moment is Perdiccas is the regent. And Ptolemy now has to become a subordinate of Perdiccas. However, Ptolemy did get the territory of Egypt. It was kind of like this consolation prize. Well, over the next few months, aggressions between the two men grew and armies were developed to go up against each other. We're looking at the brink of war between these two men. Meanwhile, Alexander's body, his dead body, is still just kind of hanging out at Nebuchadnezzar's house in Babylon. So while these two men are having a pissing contest, their buddy is just kind of there. So they go about embalming Alexander the Great, just like they did with the Egyptians. And they make the decision that Alexander is going to be buried in his namesake, which is Alexandria, Egypt. I want to also note um, how big of a deal this was to embody Alexander's body because the Greeks uh, practiced cremation mostly at this time. Um, and so the embodiment, the Egyptian embodiment already tells us that many of Alexander's followers saw Alexander as some sort of a god. And as his body was laying there in Babylon after it had it been embalmed, there was already worship that was going on at the feet of his dead body. I mean, nothing sounds more Dionysian than that. But so I just, I just want you to understand that, that it's not just that his body was kind of there. There was a cult that was forming ar around him. Like, it's so free. Listen, us humans, like, we're creepy. Like, most of these stories, I'm like, we're the creepiest planet out there. During this time, in order to move Alexander's body, they create this huge, like, funeral cart. And there's so much research on this funeral cart. This wasn't just like this little transportation device to move his his coffin. It kind of reminded me a lot of the Ark of the Covenant. Covenant, like they they put a lot into this. This was like a hunkin' piece of just gaudy or to pomp and circumstance just uh could you imagine just seeing that sucker going down the street i mean just full out like it was like a temple on wheels that carried alexander's body now alexander's body did stay in babylon for a couple of years before the transportation started now again i said that they had decided that he was going to be buried in alexandria but with the the skirmish the tension between um Perdiccas and Ptolemy, Perdiccas being the regent, decided that no, uh uh, no, no, we're going to bury Alexander back at home. That's where we're going to take his body. Screw you, Ptolemy. Screw you. We're going to take this body. We're going to put it back in its homeland so we can idolize Alexander and worship Alexander from our own home country. In my opinion, this really had nothing to do with wanting to be near Alexander's body. I think this was genuinely just a pissing contest. It was like, you know, screw you, Ptolemy. I'm just going to, I'm going to take this from you. 
you have the audacity to try to challenge me. I give you Egypt, and now you're trying to take this and put it in Egypt? Uh uh. Uh uh. Now, keep in mind that Alexander, who thought he was a god and is now treated like a god in his death state, wanted to be buried in Egypt because that's where all the other pharaohs were, were buried, right? So he thought that he should be with his own kind, the rulers, the great bloodlines of of the earth and so this was not just like two men trying to figure out where their what their buddy's final wishes is going to be these are two men that he wanted to be in egypt in fairness to alexander the great even though he was a fucking psychopath he did want to be in egypt but even though ptolemy was not actually trying to spite perdicus perdicus was trying to spite ptolemy Perdiccas also at this time tries to seal the deal with being the new and great monarch by marrying Alexander's sister. We've heard that a lot. Watch the women, right? So a lot of times when these bloodlines get interrupted and another name comes in, it's, it's, it's the same family. You just have to watch the women because it comes through the women. The same thing happened with the British royal family. You know, the, the British royal family that's on the, the throne right now yeah, they're the Windsors, but they're actually the Plantagenets. Like if you go all the way back, they're the freaking Plantagenets. You have to follow it. So when it switched from Plantagenet to Tudor, Henry the Seventh, the Tudor, married Elizabeth of York, who was the daughter of a Plantagenet king. So Henry the Eighth, Henry the Eighth's sister, who went to Scotland, who then brought down the Stuart line after the Tudor line, they're all fucking plantagenets watch the women so this is interesting that perdicus decided to marry i wonder how much i wonder if she had like did alexander the, the the great sister like have a say in this but he that's very strategic to marry alexander's sister so now you're making babies you are making babies with this particular bloodline through alexander does that make sense? So even though it's a different family name, it's the same family. Watch the women. So Ptolemy is really sly. I mean, you would have to kind of, obviously, if you've been with Alexander the Great for all these years, conquering and brutally destroying empires like the Persian Empire. It takes a lot. It took a lot, you guys, to take down the Persian Empire. And Alexander did that. So if you're with this dude for a long time, you're obviously going to learn some of the intelligence behind these horrific and barbaric takeovers. And this is why I think Ptolemy was able to maneuver what he did. So he worked out a heist with the driver of the funeral cart, aka the funeral temple. So as the cart is heading back up to Greece, when it gets to the area that is what we call modern day Syria, the cart takes a sharp turn and starts to head down towards Egypt. Now, of course, this is the olden days, the days of yarn. So there was no email. There was no mail, like mail mail that goes on an airplane and gets there quickly. So it took a few days for Perdiccas to get the message that he had been duped. Perdiccas does create an army to now go and try to get the dead body of Alexander the Great back. Ptolemy, though, is prepared for this. Once again, you guys, these two fighting enemies had lived with each other, fought with each other, been with each other for years on the battlefield. They were on the battlefield together on the same side with Alexander for a very long time. You don't think Ptolemy doesn't know Perdiccas forwards and backwards? Of course he did. Of course he did. He probably knows what Perdiccas's snores sound like because of how much time these two had spent together intimately within Alexander's military. So Ptolemy is prepared. He's prepared for Perdiccas. So he meets, he's waiting for Perdiccas. Like Ptolemy's just chilling out in Damascus with his army, just kind of like picking his fingers, waiting for Perdiccas to show up. And show up he does, but Ptolemy, he wins that day. 
and Alexander's body moves into Egypt. When Alexander's body first gets to Egypt, he's temporarily buried in Memphis, and he's buried in the tomb of, ne of Nectanebo II. Now, Nectanebo II was the last native pharaoh of Egypt. He reigned from 360 BC to 343 BC. He went into exile before his death. Therefore, his sarcophagus was never used, but was available. And I find that very interesting because this guy was the last, again, native ruler of Egypt, where, of course, we know that Ptolemy, this dude Ptolemy, becomes the next ruler, which sets up the dynasty of Ptolemy, ending with Cleopatra. So Alexander, for a moment, kind of gets his wish, right? Like he's hanging out in the sarcophagus of a legit pharaoh. That's where his body is. At this point, Perdiccas tries to outsmart Ptolemy, so comes into Egypt, sneaks into Egypt, kind of low-key, little, little spy action, a little undercover sniper action, but it seems that Perdiccas is not familiar with the savage nature of the Nile. It seems that some of his men got eaten by crocodiles. I don't mean to laugh. But, and, and you know, spending as much time, I spend most uh, parts of my year in Florida and, and alligators are, are still a problem. Not, not a problem. Like, that's their natural inhabitant, too. But you have to be very careful. There's signs everywhere, certain areas where alligators are known to live. And so you got to watch your dog, all that kind of stuff. But being about alligators and crocodiles is, I, I feel like they're kind of, they're predator animals that are kind of like lions. Like, the couple of times I've been to Africa, they've always said, you won't see a lion in the wild unless that's the last thing you see, because they won't come out unless they're feeling threatened or they're hungry. Otherwise, there could be a lion right beside you and you would never see it because it's in hiding, but it's not going to bother you because it's not feeling threatened by you, nor is it hungry. And I feel like crocodiles are kind of the same way. They're kind of predator animals in the sense that they, if they feel threatened, they will attack, or if they're hungry, they will attack. And so I kind of feel like with Perdiccas, his army just like pissed the crocodiles off. And so they ate some of them. Well, the rest of Perdiccas's men, the ones that were not eaten by the crocodiles, were so pissed at the predicament that Perdiccas had put them in in his little pissing contest with Ptolemy that they killed him. So Perdiccas died trying to one-up Ptolemy. And I don't even know if Ptolemy at the moment was aware that all this was going on in the Nile, but I guess he did become aware of it. Because after that, after there was no threat anymore of Perdiccas coming in and kidnapping the body, Alexander was moved to Alexandria. His body was placed in Alexandria's communal mausoleum. And we do have so many accounts of people going and visiting the grave of all these great famous people seeing the grave, putting things on the grave, seeing Alexander's embalmed body. But by the 4th century AD, his body was gone. And still to this day, no one knows what happened to Alexander the Great's body. I do want to mention that in 4th century AD, this is obviously when we have the Council of Nicaea, and there was a lot of... of of stuff happening in in egypt re regarding um the takeover of of the new dionysian cult which became the christian church the mithraism um we saw the fall the collapse of alexandria's library we know that even cleopatra herself her tomb is missing again that video will be down in the description box below but as we spoke about with like matahari i'll put that below as well um king henry the fourth Oliver Cromwell, all these people who have missing heads, missing body parts. Again, all those videos will be down in the description box below. We know that the powers that be, the controllers, like to do stuff with people's bodies. And I'm not so concerned with Alexander the Great because turnaround is fair play. And this guy terrorized people. And he himself, Alexander the Great, was. Hear this one I, when I say it. He was a cannibal. This guy was a cannibal. He was doing human sacrifice. And so for me as a human being, I'm not so upset about the fact that they could be doing nefarious things with his body. 
but I am curious to know like where it is, like, you know, how do you, how do you lose a body? Like, how do you lose a head? How do you lose a body? So anyway, um, that, you know, some people believe he, he could be in, in the Mediterranean sea that it could have fallen into the sea. I doubt that though. I don't think that that's, that's, um, accurate because, uh, I think that the controllers are a little bit too aware than to let that happen. But let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. Where do you think his body is? We will be discussing this later today with Shantine Mornay on Aquarius Rising Africa. As you guys know, a lot of times on Mondays, I do release the videos around 8 o'clock in the morning so that you can join us. Um, you can watch this, do your own little research if you want to, and then join us for a live discussion regarding these in-depth mysteries over on Aquarius Rising Africa. The link to that channel will also be in the description box below. But I would love to still hear your thoughts and your opinions. All right, you guys, I hope you're having a fabulous, fabulous Monday, and I will talk to you soon. Bye, everybody.